We're coming down from a stealthy solar storm that's got Earth's slingshot locked and loaded and ready for more. And some big storm producers on the sun's far side are about to rotate back into Earth view. Those stories and more are in this week's Spotlight. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is about to pick up in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, well, it may not look like all that much is going on, but there's a lot hiding behind the scenes, and we can reveal some of that magic by using a new forecasting tool that I've developed recently. You'll see it right here. Bam, look at that. Oof, what is all this spaghetti? Well, this is what the sun's magnetic field would look like if it were relaxed. And of course, the sun isn't relaxed, but nonetheless, the magnetic field here can still give us a decent idea of what its configuration can be and where things might be letting go and changing quite rapidly. Thanks to Gong's magnetic field data, they uh, put it out in real time. I've calculated the potential field source surface models in real time to show you exactly what the sun's magnetic field is doing, and it's revealing a lot of secrets. In fact, you can see a lot of these closed loops up here and a lot of closed loops down here. This looks like it's actually becoming the coronal streamer belt. This is the new dipole field of the sun. It's highly tilted. And you can see a lot of open field lines this way, the ones that are streaming out like that, that tells us a lot of fast solar wind is going out this way. So for example, what can that tell us? Well, we did happen to have a solar storm that tried to launch up in this area. In fact, you can watch it lift off right there, but a lot of it got captured and dropped back down to the sun right there. A lot of that's because we've got this closed magnetic loops right here that make it a little bit harder for these solar storms to launch out unless they're really energetic. But that's not the only thing that we can see. If we zoom back in on this region here, this is where things begin to get interesting. So you might recognize this, this kind of triangular shape. This was actually the old heart-shaped or bird-shaped coronal hole that we had last rotation. And that coronal hole bring us some fast solar wind that brought Aurora clear down deep into mid-latitudes and gave us some decent storming for over a week. It was a wonderful storm. It also had that magnetic island in the middle of it, if you recall, and that gave us some decent southward magnetic field. Well, that little island has now become region 4243, and that, it, interestingly enough, it may still have that southward magnetic field right in the middle of it. So aurora photographers, this could still be a decent aurora producer for us. So keep your eyes on it. Now, the fast solar wind from this could be delayed just a little bit because you can see the boundary of the coronal hole has changed somewhat. But where this gets very interesting is if you notice the the open field lines coming out from this region here, it's showing that this area in here could be a bit unstable. So expect that this filament, in fact, you can already see part of this filament has torn off just in the last 24 to 48 hours. So this uh, thing could, if it whole thing comes off, then we actually could have an Earth-directed solar storm. We also see some new regions that are growing and region 4244, sure enough, is firing off solar storms in this region. So keep your eyes on this region here because this is likely where a lot of the activity is. And so Aurora photographers, get ready. It could be a lot of fun here in the latter part of this week. And now taking a look at our far-sighted sun, this is Stereo A, and we can finally use Stereo A pretty religiously for far-sighted images because it's looking beyond the west limb of where we can see. In fact, you can see here's Earth 
Here's the sun and here's stereo A looking at the sun substantially from the side. And as we take a look at stereo's view, you can get that really long coronal hole right there. That should get you calibrated. You can also see a few of the regions that are in Earth view. In fact, a couple regions in here have been firing off big solar flares. And so we've been paying attention to these because as they rotate to the sun's far side, you can still see a lot of activity from them. We also are going to be getting these regions back into Earth view here soon. And I'll talk more about them during the the far sun map, which we'll show next. But we're keeping an eye on these regions. They're definitely not dimming down at all. So it looks like there's a lot of activity on the sun's far side that's gonna keep us busy next week and possibly the week after that. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect the noise on the bands to remain easily over this next week. And now switching to our full sun map, we're taking a look now at the entire sun all the way across in a flat map. And now it looks a little bit different. I've changed the colors on you because sadly, as we take a look at our orbit circle here, uh, Solar Orbiter is actually on the front side of the sun. So we're no longer able to see the far side from Solar Orbiter's view. So what we've brought in now is we've got Earth as we, as we have it. That's in red. You can see the Earth side of the sun right here. We have Stereo A. Air Stereo A is in green. You can see that part behind us. But we also have the Helioseismology Farsighted Viewer. This is uh, JSOC giving us at least some kind of sounding of the sun from the far side. I've decided to include that in our maps because I think we've got enough coverage now on the far side that it's not too bad. So as I set this in motion, I want you to see there's the regions that are just leaving Stereo's view here. These have been pretty active. Here's the other set of regions, especially in here, we've got region 42, 26, 27. These were pretty active too. So pay attention to these regions. And of course, to these regions, region 4217 had been extremely active. I'm going to stand on this side. 4217 had been extremely active on the front side of the sun when we had it probably about three weeks ago. So as we put this in motion, you can definitely see these regions are continuing their, their activity. In fact, they may even be growing. So expect for amateur radio operators and emergency responders, expect to see region 4220 coming back into Earth view. And then in about three or four days, expect all of these regions to rotate back into Earth view. And this means not only will the noise on the dayside radio bands increase, but the risk for big solar flares and big radio blackouts will be on the rise and it will likely stay with us easily throughout next week. And now switching to our near Earth space radiation environment, We've been dealing with a stealthy solar storm over the last 48 hours that really has had a magnetic orientation to kind of load up the Earth's magnetic system and make it prime to storm. In fact, as we take a look at the heart of the Earth's magnetic system here, you can see the radiation belts. The heart of the radiation belts already turning red, starting around the third and the fourth. And that means that satellite operators in, Le in MEO and in GEO, you can see this radiation clock right here. In fact, on the outer ring, you can see we've been getting those low energy particles. These are the ones that cause surface charging on spacecraft. They've been building up in the post-midnight sector. But as we continue on through about the fourth and the fifth, you're seeing that heart of the magnetosphere really begin to light up completely. And that inner ring, this is the higher energy particle environment, really begin to light up all the way around the orbit. And this is because you have internal charging. These are the higher energy particles really beginning to build up there. So satellite operators in uh, geo and in MEO environments, you're dealing with an incredibly harsh environment right now because those internal particles can cause discharges uh, and upsets, including single event effects. And those who rely on satellite services pretty heavily, you might be noticing a few glitches here and there. But this is going to continue to be the norm here over the next uh, maybe month or so as we continue to have these fast wind streams and sometimes these stealthy solar storms come and load up the environment like this. This is also why you're going to see elevated fluxes in our radiation storm environment outlooks. So we're going to have to be dealing with easily over the next month or two until we get further away from the equinox, because that's where the problems really lie. Now, stepping outside to take a look at our current conditions with our global geochron map, you can see from our radio blackout threat meter here, the dayside radio bands have been getting a little bit of impact from radio blackouts only at the R1 level. In fact, as you can see here, it's only been affecting up to about 15 megahertz. So it's not that big a deal. Those amateur radio operators and emergency responders who monitor the HF and VHF bands, you can see the contacts have been pretty solid 
uh, even through most of the frequencies ranges here. So it's not been a big impact. We're going to be seeing a lot of that die down uh, over the next couple days. So it's going to get a little bit quieter. But then near the end of the week, we're going to start seeing the radio blackouts begin to rise back up again. And that's because of those new regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view. So enjoy the relative quiet while you have it, because things could change here near the end of the week. Now, the more interesting aspect comes when we take a look at Roti. Now, Roti is effect is this is the scintillation risk index that affects higher frequencies like GPS and GNSS. And you can see these hot spots here that have been at low latitudes. And that's kind of a problem because if, if you've been paying attention to earthquakes, we've actually been having, we had a big earthquake in Papua New Guinea. And you don't necessarily like to see low latitude scintillation because those people who are doing emergency response and needing GPS or GNSS uh, for the search and rescue operations. Note that you can be having a bit of scintillation. Luckily, that's going to change a little bit. You start seeing it move to higher latitudes here as Aurora begins to take over, and that's going to continue as we go into uh, the next fast wind stream as we get to the end of the week. So hopefully the uh, the hopefully that this lat this area in here will be left alone. But be aware if you're a search and rescue or uh, emergency responder to this big earthquake that's that hit just the other day. Uh, you're going to be dealing with scintillation probably around around dusk, sometimes near dawn, but definitely on the night side, you're going to be having some issues. And now as we switch to Aurora, you can see we've been having a bit of Aurora. I'm going to come over here. In fact, there's where that Papua New Guinea uh, earthquake occurred. Uh, you can see we have a little bit of Aurora going on. It's not been all that intense. This is mainly from that stealthy solar storm that's done more to load the Earth's magnetic system and get that slingshot primed and ready than it's done to actually cause big storming and big Aurora shows. So Aurora folks, recognize that you're going to be primed and ready to have more Aurora happening here uh, as we move into the weekend when that big fast wind hits. So keep your batteries charged. Now, switching to our moon, we are coming out of a full moon on our way to a third quarter. And by the 14th, the moon will still be about 42% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, well, you're going to have this bright companion. And so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are calming down from that a uh, solar storm, that stealthy solar storm that's really managed to kind of load that slingshot of the Earth's magnetic system. We're expecting that we're pretty preconditioned. So when that fast solar wind hits us somewhere around the 11th or the 12th, likely we're going to jump into big storming. So we have a couple days. You have about the 9th and the 10th to kind of have things settle down just a little bit. But by the 11th and the 12th, we should be up to active and possibly major storm conditions. In fact, about a 65% chance of major storm conditions at high latitudes for you aurora photographers. So get your cameras ready because we should have some decent storming here as we move through the weekend. And now at mid latitudes, while we're only having unsettled conditions as we calm down from that stealthy solar storm, but again, right about the 11th, we're going to start that wind watch. Now, because of that region 4243 kind of cutting into the boundary of that coronal hole, we don't really know when that wind is going to hit us this time. It could be until the 12th, but don't give up hope because we'll likely hit minor storm conditions. In fact, we have up to about a 45% chance of a major storm at mid latitudes. So you aurora photographers, you could get a chance at mid latitudes to catch some gorgeous shows once again. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting well into the triple digits for solar flux. This means noise on the dayside radio bands is going to be high, but propagation is also pretty good. We're expecting moderate noise right now, which might pop down into the minor noise range for the night through about the 11th, but then it'll stop popping back up into the moderate noise range again as those regions from the far side begin to rotate into Earth view. NOAA's giving us about a 35% chance of M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout. And right now, about a 10% chance of X-class flares. That's going to die down really fast. And you'll see it begin to pick up as we move into the weekend again, as those other regions on the sun's far side uh, end up rotating into Earth view. And we'll get a better look at them to see whether or not they're going to be big flare players. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, 
We are in the green when it comes to radiation storms. We're at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. Of course, we are seeing elevated conditions periodically, and this has not to do, nothing to do with the sun right now. This is actually everything to do with Earth's own trapped radiation. We're actually getting elevated radiation levels because we are just in that time of, of the solar cycle and the equinox where we're getting a lot of fast wind streams that are really pumping up those radiation belts. So expect a little elevated conditions kind of up and down uh, the 8th and around the 10th. We should uh, see it possibly into the 11th and then it'll get flushed when that fast solar wind hits and then of course it'll slowly build back up again. So satellite operators, you're going to be dealing with this. Anyone who has, uh, you know, can, who, who relies on space-based uh, services, you might see little glitches here and there. But overall, things should be pretty much in the... So the space weather this week is about to get very exciting. Now we're coming down from a stealthy solar storm, but that solar storm has preconditioned the Earth because it's caused that Earth's magnetic shield slingshot to get locked and loaded and ready for that fast solar wind. So aurora photographers, even down to mid-latitudes, keep your eyes out on the 11th and even into the 12th because that fast solar wind's going to arrive somewhere in there and it could bring aurora clear down deep into mid-latitudes easily over the whole weekend and possibly longer before things calm down. And now amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, the night side's not going to be so great for you uh, when the weekend hits, and neither will the day side either because we also have those regions rotating back into Earth view, and they could bring with it more radio blackouts. So just expect radio propagation is going to be good for the next couple days, but as we move into the weekend, things are going to begin to tank. And now you GPS users, well, the news isn't all that great for you either. You've got a nice couple days. But once that weekend hits, you're going to have issues on the night side because you're going to have to have deal with Aurora. And of course, on the day side, those radio blackouts might pick up. So be sure to stay vigilant, especially near dawn and near dusk, anywhere near Aurora. And if you are a drone flyer, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.